How's it going, folks? Welcome back to part 4 of What If The Levelers Won The British Civil Wars. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like afterwards and share it, as well as give me your feedback in the comments. Now let's get into it. November 10th, 1648 was a rainy, gloomy day by all accounts. It was also one of the most important days in the history of New England. On this day, Oliver Cromwell's ship, the Fairfax, sailed into Plymouth Bay with 100 people aboard. The Fairfax would be but the first of 19 ships to arrive. Cromwell, the defeated military leader of the British parliamentarians, had fled to exile in America with his family after being defeated by the Lovelers, along with his most trusted advisors and the military leadership of the New Model Army. However, the two-month-long voyage had drastically changed the defeated leader. For the first week, Cromwell had been in anguish, endlessly mulling over his defeat, replaying events in his head over and over again. Regret and shame consumed him, and he quickly became the epitome of a broken man. This state of affairs continued until late September, when Lady Cromwell sought the intervention of a spiritual advisor, greatly concerned that her husband would throw himself overboard any day now. Thankfully, on board the Fairfax there was a fiery preacher by the name of Praise God Barebone. Barebone, a cunning and intense man popular amongst the army leadership, had exploited the hopelessness that had consumed the army grandees as the war turned in the Leveler's favor. By late August, Barebone had become the spiritual counsel to Major General Thomas Harrison, one of Cromwell's closest allies, who had secured Barebone a spot on board the Fairfax. Once aboard the ship, Barebone became more influential than ever before. After landing in the Assos Islands, where Portuguese dissidents supplied their English allies with additional supplies, Barebone had a seizure which was accompanied by a vision. In this vision, St. Michael the Archangel appeared before Barebone with an urgent message from the Divine Beyond. The age of tribulation was upon mankind, in fact it had been for some time, however now the tribulation had reached a new level of mortal danger for the world and its faithful. The Antichrist had emerged, in England of all places, taking the appearance of a man called Freeborn John and spreading a false gospel comprised of disruptive and heretical ideals designed to destroy civilization. However, there would be no need to despair. The war in England was meant to be lost. The collapse of the Stuart dynasty was an omen of things yet to come, for the kingdom of Charles I was the fourth monarchy foretold in the second chapter of the Book of Daniel. With the end of the fourth and final monarchy of mankind, the time had come for Christ to return to earth and establish a fifth monarchy, establishing a kingdom of the saints on earth. The age of tribulation would then be supplanted by a messianic age, wherein Christ would do battle with the great dragon and cast him into a lake of fire. One thousand years of peace would follow, after which the devil would return for a final battle with the forces of heaven. Upon recovery from the seizure, Barebone spoke the truth which had been revealed to him to any who would listen, and as the refugees made their way from the Assos Islands to Plymouth, many of the passengers became devout followers of Barebone, finding solace in the visions the divine mystery had presented to them. On October 1st, 1648, Barebone intervened after Crewman found Cromwell ready to throw himself to the ocean. Barebone pleaded with Cromwell that he was the anointed one of mankind who would forge a new path ahead and make ready the earth for Christ's return. The shores of Plymouth represented the gateway to God's last bastion on earth. Successfully talked down from taking his own life, Cromwell became an ardent follower of Barebone, who breathed new life into the remnants of the New Model Army leadership. By mid-October, the group had taken on a new name, the Fifth Monarchists. As the Fairfax docked in Plymouth Bay and its passengers disembarked, a crowd began to form in the harbor to witness the spectacle of it all. The new arrivals were hit with a barrage of questions as to their purpose here and the fate of England. What the people of Plymouth heard shocked them. Not just England, but all of the British Isles had fallen to darkness, and the Antichrist had emerged. The English Civil War, having raged on for years now, was over, but neither Parliament nor the King had emerged victorious. In their folly, both sides destroyed each other until the two factions were weak enough to be overtaken by a third. This third faction was known as the Levellers, a wicked cabal funded by Papists, who militarized the peasantry and toppled Cromwell's godly government. Cromwell and his followers had fled at the last moment to save the lives of the women and children and find a new home here in America. The people of Plymouth Colony, having supported Cromwell in both timelines, viewed him as a hero and soldier of Christ. Now, having lost everything, he had come to join them. The community at large welcomed the Cromwellian refugees with open arms 
providing the perfect opportunity for the fifth monarchist movement to metastasize. Of course, not everyone in Plymouth was as excited as the crowd who'd met Cromwell in the Bay. Plymouth's governor, William Bradford, was weary of Cromwell's arrival, especially after being informed that he should anticipate roughly 1,500 more fifth monarchists arriving in Plymouth in the coming days, which would double the colony's size. Offsetting the impact of this large wave of immigration would be easy by enlisting the help of the other colonies, but what worried Governor Bradburn most was the political power Cromwell had arrived with and the threat it posed to his authority. In the coming months, the new refugees would be resettled across the colonies of New England, with the bulk remaining in Plymouth Colony, including Cromwell and the Army Grandees. Barebone, now enjoying the full support of Cromwell, would devote himself to spreading the good news which St. Michael had revealed to him. However, as Governor Bradford caught wind of the new movement rising in his colony, meetings quickly shifted to secretive nighttime gatherings. The Fifth Monarchists would soon expand far beyond the town of Plymouth to the entire colony, with the movement soon acquiring a political element to it, as Cromwell frequently lambasted Governor Bradford as a weak, spineless man who lacked both ambition and faith during the group's meetings. Barebone would preach that the people of Plymouth needed stronger leadership to shepherd the faithful. Cromwell singled out Bradford's efforts to make peace with the local Indians as an indication that he consorted with pagans and heathens. The turning point for the fifth monarchists came on the night of December 27, 1648. During a nighttime revival meeting, Oliver Cromwell declared that the kingdom of the saints would never be achieved without fighting to establish one. Although God would be arriving soon, the land would have to be prepared to receive him. In Cromwell's own words, the soil of our society must be tilled if the Lord God is to plant the seeds from which will grow the fruit of everlasting salvation. Cromwell stated that the mission of the fifth monarchists going forward was to forge a new society devoted solely to glorifying Christ and enforcing the laws of scripture to ensure the land was pure and sanctified for the Messiah's return. The fifth monarchists, in service to God, were to seize power by any means necessary and establish the kingdom of the saints. With Cromwell's cult threatening the safety of the once sleepy colony, Governor Bradford finally ordered the colonial militia to break up a fifth monarchist revival meeting in Plymouth on the night of February 11th, 1649, but Governor Bradford had waited too long. When the colonial militiamen arrived to break apart the gathering by force, they were met by Miles Standish, the retired commander of the Plymouth Colony Militia renowned for his leadership and feared for his brutality against the Indians. Standish, putting himself between the gathering and the militiamen, implored them to lay down their arms and stand together with Cromwell just as Standish himself had recently done. Standish argued that for all their lives, as soldiers, they had been left to rectify by force the mistakes made and sins committed by politicians. Now was the time for soldiers of God to lead instead of follow. Heeding the words of Standish, the Plymouth Militia pledged themselves to the Fifth Monarchists. In the very early hours of the morning on February 12, 1649, an angry mob of militiamen and Plymouth residents, branding themselves the Army of the Saints, attacked and laid siege to Governor Bradford's private residence. Bradford surrendered himself to save the lives of his family, who were still inside the residence, only to have his home torched once he had been put in irons. Governor Bradford was then tarred and feathered on Cromwell's orders, before being mercifully put out of his misery by a local hunter after hours of agony. As the ashes fell across Plymouth, Oliver Cromwell, flanked by Miles Standish, proclaimed the abolition of Plymouth Colony and the creation of the Kingdom of the Saints, with himself, of course, as Lord Protector of the Faith. The whole spectacle was put to paper by one of its eyewitnesses. Anne Bradstreet, a Massachusetts poet accompanying her husband to Plymouth on business, wrote that the arrival of Lord Cromwell in Plymouth was a shock to all who bore witness. Since then, Lord Cromwell has only served to be an avatar of surprise and upheaval in the small community. Until today, they had welcomed him as a hero who had journeyed here to find a life of peace in the New World. But it seems that his journey, his prior defeat, has had a drastic effect on the man. For he came here envisioning himself as their ruler. He did not come to the New World to find peace. He came here to bring the problems of the Old World with him. On February 19th, 1649, Oliver Cromwell held his official coronation ceremony as Lord Protector of the Faith, promising to unify New England and begin a godly revolution to bring forth the second coming of Christ. In his speech, Cromwell stated, The apostates, the usurers, the whoremongers, the blasphemers, the traitors, the pagans, the savages, the papists, the thieves, this is what we face in our crusade. These are the forces who ruled over this land before our arrival, but I swear this before God, all of them shall meet my sword. 
Cromwell's vision for the future of America rested on the reforging of the colonies into a kingdom of the saints, united against every threat, both internal and external, a message attractive to many Puritans in New England. In Connecticut and Massachusetts, demonstrations were held in support of Cromwell's vision. Concurrently, the colonies of Rhode Island and New Haven did not see very much support at all for Cromwell materialize within them. By the way, back then Rhode Island was simply called Providence Plantations, but I will be referring to it as Rhode Island just for simplicity's sake going forward. With the rise of the Army of the Saints, now bolstered by the incorporation of the Plymouth Militia and led by seasoned veterans of the British Civil Wars, the rest of the New England colonies grew nervous. Massachusetts in particular, as the strongest of the remaining free colonies, suffered from disorder as its government worked to root out fifth monarchist cells across the colony. Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop emerged as an effective wartime leader as the Plymouth Crisis began to be called Cromwell's War. In correspondence with Governors Jeremiah Clark of Rhode Island and Theophilus Eaton of New Haven, Governor Winthrop sought to form a united front against Cromwell. However, Connecticut Governor Edward Hopkins greatly weakened Winthrop's attempts to create a military coalition when, on February 27, 1649, he came out in support of the Kingdom of the Saints, pledging fealty to Cromwell and hosting Praise God Barebone in Hartford, although this would result in unrest throughout the colony. Regardless of the loss of Connecticut's official support, many colonists from Connecticut and Plymouth pledged themselves to the cause of the anti-Cromwell forces, relocating to Massachusetts, New Haven, and Rhode Island in preparation for the coming war. On March 1st, 1649, Clark, Eaton, and Winthrop drafted an alliance forming an army comprised of all three colonial militias called the Army of the Willing. In response to this development, Cromwell, terming the colonial alliance the Coalition of the Antichrist, began provoking agitation amongst fifth monarchist cells in Massachusetts, leading to renewed disorder in the powerful colony. At the same time, on March 14th, roughly half of the Massachusetts militia was sent northwards, where the Royalist militia of the province of Maine massed on the border between Maine and Massachusetts' northeast region of New Hampshire, hoping to seize the territory for themselves amidst the chaos of Cromwell's war. On March 26th, 1649, Massachusetts Governor Winthrop died suddenly of natural causes. His death could not have come at a worse time. As the news of his death spread, a power vacuum was created in Massachusetts, provoked by the simmering undercurrents of division that could be felt throughout the entire colony. Praise God Barebone, believing Winthrop's death to be a sign from God, urged the Lord Protector to strike now and strike hard. On March 27, 1649, General Thomas Venner of the Army of the Saints invaded Massachusetts with a force of 2,500 men. The Army of the Willing, with its forces unassembled and the local Massachusetts militia stretched thin, was absolutely steamrolled by General Venner. Massachusetts, a leaderless colony with a fighting force too small to defend it at the moment, fell to the Army of the Saints on March 29, 1649. As the Lord Protector entered Boston on horseback, the Army of the Willing scrambled to extract its remaining forces from Massachusetts and regroup in Rhode Island. By April 5th, this had been achieved. With the conspicuous retreat of the Massachusetts militia, the governor of Maine, Edward Godfrey, ordered his forces to seize New Hampshire in the name of King Charles I. After all, when the king was eventually restored, he would be rewarded handsomely for taking action against the Puritans. The entry of the Royalists into Cromwell's war brought the anti-Cromwell forces badly needed time, turning Cromwell's attention northwards instead of towards New Haven and Rhode Island. Across the conquered colonies, a nightmarish existence was unleashed upon any citizens who were found to be out of line with the new social order imposed upon them by administrators advised by Praise God Barebone. Barebone himself stated that while Cromwell fought the external threats, it was his duty to combat internal ones. Following this logic, Barebone appointed Matthew Hopkins, his young protege, the Witchfinder General of the Kingdom of the Saints, unleashing a great terror upon the women of New England. During his tenure in the position, Hopkins, basing his operations in the town of Salem, Massachusetts, would sentence dozens of women to death across New England for practicing witchcraft. These women were almost always associated with Cromwell's political enemies or were elderly. With war brewing between Maine and the Kingdom of the Saints, the rest of April was spent resettling refugees across New Haven and Rhode Island thanks to a reduced Army of the Saints presence in Connecticut during the war with Maine. However, by early May, Governor Jeremiah Clark of Rhode Island announced in a private meeting with colonial officials that he intended to seek peace with Cromwell in the name of avoiding further bloodshed. Without Governor Clark's knowledge, one of his officials leaked the news of his defeatist sentiments to the town criers of Providence. Public opinion rapidly turned against Governor Clark as word spread of his defeatism. 
The people of Rhode Island were prepared to fight for their freedom and had no use for a governor who wouldn't fight for his. On May 11, 1649, Governor Clark was toppled in a coup d'etat by the Rhode Island colonial militia. In his place, the colony's founder, Roger Williams, assumed the governorship once more. Williams, widely regarded as an amicable man and a good governor, initially wanted absolutely nothing to do with the coup. It was only after hearing several testimonials of survivors who'd fled Cromwell's forces that Williams gained a certain fire within him, and along with it the will to openly fight for the freedom of his colony. May 1649 also saw the outbreak of brutal fighting across New Hampshire between the Maine militia and the Army of the Saints. Unknowingly buying time for Rhode Island and New Haven, the Maine militia locked down a sizable chunk of the Army of the Saints for the time being and inflicted heavy casualties. Roger Williams spent the rest of May 1649 drafting a new plan of action. At this point, purely in the spirit of pragmatism, Williams had abandoned the original plan of a unified colonial militia fighting Cromwell in open battle. They simply no longer had the numbers. However, when news reached Providence that the Army of the Saints had begun obliterating Indian villages across Massachusetts and Connecticut, Governor Williams, known for his good relations with the local tribes, had an idea. With Cromwell hell-bent on depopulating the remaining Indian tribes in the area, Williams decided to propose a military alliance between the colonists and the tribes, first reaching out to his old friend, Usamaquin, chief of the Wampanoag Confederation. Williams himself went as Rhode Island's envoy, meeting with Usamaquin at the village of Montop, where he would deliver an impassioned plea to the mighty chief. Chief Usamaquin of the Wampanoag I come before thee today as a representative of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations with an urgent message. A villainous killer, Oliver Cromwell, has arrived upon the shores that we long ago agreed to share, bearing a thirst for blood. His sword knows no difference between the blood of the white man and that of an Indian. He seeks the subjugation of my people and the destruction of yours. I beseech you, great chief, let our two peoples be joined together in this time of war, just as we once joined together in a time of peace. The wise chief, who had already planned on fighting back, rejoiced that Williams and his people had come to join him in the coming struggle. Usamaquin also noted that the intervention of Williams, renowned as a peacemaker, might be able to help unite all of the major tribes, many of whom hated each other, in a coalition to defeat Cromwell. On August 1st, the Royalist offensive into New Hampshire collapsed. On October 10th, Maine's capital, Saco, fell to the Army of the Saints, led by the Lord Protector himself. Governor Godfrey of Maine personally surrendered to Cromwell, who, in return, had him beheaded as a reward, with the rest of Maine's colonial government drawn and quartered. From there, the Army of the Saints ran amok, butchering and destroying the Royalists and their towns for daring to take up arms in the name of Charles I, a known papist and coward. Such was the devastation of Maine that in the utter chaos that followed, the French seized the province of Avalon, incorporating it into their territory and bringing the island of New Finland under full French control. With the province of Maine left in ruins and Massachusetts reaffirming its control of New Hampshire, the Army of the Saints began the journey back south, prepared to crush the Rhode Island and New Haven holdouts once and for all. On October 22, 1649, a war council was hosted by Usamaquin and Roger Williams. Attending tribes included the Narragansett, Wampanoag, Pequots, Nipmucks, Nashoy, Podunks, Massachusetts, Pawtucket, Mohegans, and Penacooks. The chief and the governor, both charismatic speakers, provided testimonials to the uninformed and spoke of the dire stakes of New England's fight for freedom. After two days of deliberation, the tribes of New England agreed to stand together so that Cromwell may be driven back into the sea from whence he crawled. On November 15, 1649, the Army of the Saints entered Connecticut, cracking down on rogue supply lines, enforcing their authority and cutting off the land routes between New Haven and Rhode Island. Quickly thereafter, the Allied tribes began to retreat to Rhode Island as Cromwell directed his forces to focus on the extermination of the Indians. In the early hours of December 1st, the Army of the Saints launched a surprise attack on New Haven Colony, overrunning their defenses in a day and sacking and burning the so-called Wicked City to the ground. Amidst the New Haven Massacre, many of its residents were able to escape to Rhode Island on the Phantom, a massive trading ship captained by local merchant George Lamberton. The fall of New Haven came as a shock to Governor Williams. Although the smaller colony hadn't received as many defenders, it had been thought that their fortifications would have been able to withstand at least an initial assault by the Army of the Saints. On December 2nd, the Phantom arrived in Providence, where the survivors disembarked, speaking of the unimaginable horrors that had been visited upon them. Among the survivors was Theophilus Eaton, governor of the Lost Colony. 
Eaton, a proud man who'd been dragged to the boat after committing himself to fall with the city of New Haven, demanded justice for the crimes of Cromwell. With Rhode Island the last remaining free colony in New England, things were tense as the army of the saints began to gather just beyond the colony's borders. For Oliver Cromwell, his campaign of cleansing the land's impurities had gone absolutely swimmingly. The old colonial governments, too drunk on power to have ever submitted themselves to the authority of Christ, had all been wiped away, save for Rhode Island. Cromwell reveled in the newfound power he'd once again amassed. His loss in England had been about a temporary setback that put him on the path of his true destiny. When he wasn't fighting, Cromwell spent his days administering the kingdom of the saints from its capital, Boston, while, praise God, Barebone, now Cromwell's chief minister, crafted godly legislature that would allow their new utopia to flourish in the last few months before Christ's imminent return. So content with himself was Cromwell that he failed to notice when, on December 24th, 1649, his trusted aide-de-camp, Christopher Feek, absconded in the middle of the night with a copy of Cromwell's battle plans for the invasion of Rhode Island. Under the cover of night, Feek, a leveler agent embedded within the New Model Army long ago, would ride from Boston to Providence, an event later memorialized as the Midnight Ride of Christopher Feek. At 7 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day, 1649, an exhausted Feek would ride into Providence with Cromwell's invasion plans. Alerting the militia of his precious cargo, Feek's arrival would trigger an emergency meeting on how best to proceed next. While Governor Williams, his militia leaders, and the Indian warriors poured over the plans, Mr. Feek knew the time had come to share some advice. Addressing all present, Feek said that even now, with the colonists and the Indians united, there was no countering the numbers of the Army of the Saints. At this rate, Rhode Island's economy would eventually collapse under the stress of a prolonged war with a much larger foe, as would its defenses. The time had come to take drastic action. Feek recommended that Governor Williams make contact with a new republic in London and plead for their intervention. Williams had been weary of inviting the new government, an unknown variable at the time, to take over governance of the colonies. Sensing this, Feek would deliver an impassioned speech about what these so-called levelers stood for. Freedom, democracy, religious tolerance, and rights for all men, because all men were born free. That was what the levelers stood for. Furthermore, the military capabilities of the British Republic were extensive, and Feek knew beyond any certainty that they would be capable of driving Cromwell out of New England forever. After consulting with his closest advisors, Governor Williams accepted Feek's proposal, drafting up a small set of terms in exchange for the assistance of the new government in London, namely that they would respect the authority of his colonial government in exchange for him pledging allegiance to their national government, and that they would maintain all of the colony's current laws. At the same time, former New Haven governor Theophilus Eaton began writing an account of Cromwell's invasion thus far, all at Mr. Feek's urging, with Feek telling Eaton that with the new government so dedicated to peace, it would be difficult to sway them to wage war so soon after the end of the last one. After weeks of preparation, on February 15, 1650, Theophilus Eaton, Christopher Feek, their security personnel, and colonial diplomats boarded a ship bound for England, aptly named the Hope. The goodbyes at the harbor were solemn. The crew of the Hope were on a mission to save their colony from ruin and all of New England from tyranny. On May 5th, 1650, after nearly 12 weeks at sea, the Hope reached the shores of the British Republic, ironically landing in the port city of Plymouth in the county of Devon. Governor Eaton would serve as the official ambassador of sorts, quickly informing the local authorities that he bore an urgent message from the New England colonies intended for the new national government. On May 15th, the envoys would reach the Republic's capital, the City of London. Governor Eaton would later write, The London we arrived in was not the same London from the memories of my boyhood. Everywhere we looked, we saw public debates on government policy, open kitchens for the needy, soldiers working to build new housing, and of course, the most inescapable facet of this new London was the plethora of sea-green banners hanging from every building which could support them. I had thought that the new world was the land of change alone. But it seems that there was still a little bit of change left to be had in the old world as well. On June 20th, 1650, Governor Eaton was able to meet with the British Republic's newly elected president, John Lilburn, and inform him of what had transpired following Cromwell's flight from Lancashire. Furthermore, he presented numerous accounts of wrongdoings of the highest order being committed by Cromwell's forces, as written in Eaton's landmark treatise, The Crimes of Cromwell, which would go on to be a significant historical text for future historians of British history. Freeborn John took a moment to take in the information after Eaton had finished speaking, before responding. Governor, 
If you are a man of your word, and I think you to be one, I firstly grieve for the losses you have sustained in New England. Truly, I am outraged to hear that that scoundrel, that villain, Oliver Cromwell, has continued to pursue power and tyranny in the New World. I am particularly disturbed to hear that he has joined a sort of death cult. Right now, if you ask me to wage war anywhere in the world, I, and the people of our young republic, would resoundingly reject this request. However, it would seem that military intervention in the New England colonies is not only just, but a necessity, if we are to prevent the creation of a rogue state in the New World. Although we have not yet enforced our existing claims to the American colonies which we inherited from the Crown, and we do not plan to for the most part, I believe the incorporation of New England into our young and prospering democracy is completely possible, especially with like-minded democratic thinkers such as yourself and Governor Williams. At the same time, in our new nation, a declaration of war requires a national vote. It is not simply something me and my generals just do whenever we are bored, unlike in the past. The only unilateral action I can take in accordance with the Constitution is activating the army of the people to suppress internal insurrection against our people's government. This will take some time for me to figure out our best course of action in consultation with Congress, as I think a national vote on whether to wage war would fail at this moment. But rest assured, we will free your people from the yoke of tyranny, Mr. Eaton. This I swear to you before God Almighty. On June 25th, Governor Eaton, remaining in London to drum up support for his cause, was invited to a special session of Congress on July 4th by James Harrington, a congressman from Northamptonshire and a close disciple of Freeborn John. Meeting with Harrington on June 27th, Governor Eaton would tell him what he had told the President about Cromwell, and read from his treatise. Harrington, a radical advocate for freedom and democracy across the world, would arrange for the crimes of Cromwell to be sent to a publishing house he had connections to, and for the treatise to be printed en masse at his expense, beginning an ideological offensive promoting military intervention within the court of public opinion. On July 1st, the first printings of The Crimes of Cromwell reached the British public, causing an outrage. One of the most heinous leaders of the old tyranny had gone to perpetuate it elsewhere. Public opinion regarding an intervention to save New England ticked sharply towards support after the publication. On July 4th, 1650, the Army of the Saints began its invasion of Rhode Island, overrunning the easternmost portion of the colony and beginning an offensive southwards. Luckily, the northern offensive was halted thanks to Rhode Island forces combining Indian guerrilla warfare with the artillery of the New England militia to choke supply lines and beat back the Army of the Saints. However, many of Governor Williams' military advisors warned him that Rhode Island could not survive more than a year in these current conditions. As the war in Rhode Island raged on, at the special session of Congress on July 4, 1650, Congressman James Harrington, with the full support of the national government, put forth a bill entitled, The Act to Recognize Holdings in America, which would declare the New England colonies to be an inseparable part of the British Republic. In passing this act, military action to stop Cromwell would be an internal security operation to suppress a violent anti-democratic rebellion, rather than a foreign war requiring a national vote. That same day, the act to recognize British holdings in America was passed by a vote of 280 to 20, a veto-proof supermajority, and signed into law by President Lilburn, transforming the New England colonies into a constituent county of the British Republic, America County. Shortly thereafter, events moved very quickly. Robert Blake, general at sea of the People's Fleet, was appointed by President Lilburn to be the commander of a military expedition to America, and quickly began assembling an invasion fleet over several months. All the while, Rhode Island continued to desperately hold out on its own, albeit with mounting losses. Finally, on October 10, 1650, the Republican fleet, consisting of 40 warships and 15 supply vessels, carrying 12,000 men in total, would set sail for New England. On December 20th, 1650, the leaguered Scots would report to Governor Williams that the British fleet had been spotted on the horizon. Their arrival came just in time, as the northern defensive lines keeping the Army of Saints from sacking Providence had been under heavy stress and were predicted to collapse soon. With one ship lost at sea, 54 Republican ships now made their way to liberate New England. Although the Kingdom of the Saints had a small naval defense force to complement its impressive land army, the British Republic's navy completely smashed through the kingdom's naval forces off the coast of New England before ever making landfall. As per General Blank's invasion plans, the fleet would be divided in half. Twenty-seven ships would make their way up towards Providence to immediately deploy the forces of the Army of the People before beginning a blockade of Massachusetts and Plymouth. Likewise, twenty-seven ships, one of them carrying Governor Eaton, 
would land at New Haven and retake the city, establishing a beachhead to siphon away forces currently besieging northern Rhode Island. The 1650 winter offensive had begun. The tables would soon turn for the Army of the Saints, who only numbered roughly 8,000 men. The 60,000 strong expeditionary forces of the Army of the People of the first 27 ships, under the command of Secretary of War Robert Lilburn, landed in Providence and rushed to reinforce the front lines, much to the surprise of the Army of the Saints. The landings in New Haven came as an absolute shock to the small garrison of the Army of the Saints who had been occupying the devastated city. As their meager defenses crumbled, the surviving people of New Haven, who had suffered several massacres under the occupation, began openly revolting against the Army of the Saints. Together, the citizens and the Army of the People were able to take back New Haven in just a single day. From New Haven, the Army of the People dislodged the Army of the Saints from all of New Haven Colony on December 26, 1650. On December 30, 1650, the kingdom's offensive in northern Rhode Island was shattered by the Army of the People, fighting alongside the reinvigorated militia and Indian forces. With General Blake's blockade now in full effect, fishing vessels could not harvest any food, and the economy of the Kingdom of the Saints collapsed. The Lord Protector himself, now too far gone to see any semblance of reason, remained steadfast in his belief that victory would ultimately be his, especially with praise God Barebun whispering this in his ear. With the harsh winter coming, both sides settled in for the long winter, and while January saw almost no fighting, it did see more reinforcements from Britain arrive to aid in the upcoming spring offensive. By March 1st, the bitter cold had subsided, and fighting resumed between the Army of the People and the Army of the Saints. March 15th would see the liberation of eastern Rhode Island by the Army of the People. Of particular joy to their indigenous allies was the reclamation of Montop, the village of Chief Osamaquin. By late March, the numerical advantage of the Republican forces overwhelmed the Army of the Saints, with Plymouth and Connecticut fully liberated on March 22nd and March 27th respectively, as a combined force of 18,000 men made the push into Massachusetts. On April 2nd, 1651, the small town of Springfield, Massachusetts was liberated by the Army of the People, leaving only the eastern coastal region of Massachusetts under Cromwell's control as the push to liberate New Hampshire began. On April 11th, rumor had spread that the Army of the People were just a few miles out from Salem, causing a riot to erupt as an angry mob of women, sons, husbands, and fathers stormed the office of the Witchfinder General. Matthew Hopkins, discovered cowering under his desk, was emasculated before being torn to pieces by the crowd. The soldiers Cromwell had sent to protect Hopkins quickly fled to Boston rather than attempt to intervene. Twenty-one starving and dying women were rescued by the mob from the cells in which Hopkins had kept them. The army of the people was welcomed into Salem as benevolent liberators by the residents who'd suffered greatly under Cromwell's tyrannical yoke. By April 15th, the remaining Cromwell loyalists had retreated to the city of Boston, where the Lord Protector and his allies awaited the final battle, convinced that in their moment of need the Lord would intervene and smite their foes. On April 17, 1651, at General Lilburn's command, the Army of the People and their local allies began the final battle of Cromwell's war, the Battle for Boston. The entire affair was horrifically bloody, with the Duggan Army of the Saints utilizing door-to-door -door combat and human shields. However, they were no match for the forces of the British Republic. As the end neared, Lord Protector Cromwell received word that both of his sons had been killed in the fighting, and arranged for his daughters and wife to escape to New Netherland. Following this, the Lord Protector, now seeing that no miracle was coming, ordered the assassination of Praise God Barebone before resigning the role of Lord Protector effective immediately. With this accomplished, Oliver Cromwell, the terror of New England, drank a bottle of poison and died. By the morning hours of April 18th, 1651, much of Boston lay in ruin. The Kingdom of the Saints had been swept away by the revolutionary might of the British Republic, and their villainous army was shattered for good. Through the smoke and the rubble, on a flagpole overlooking Boston Harbor, Roger Williams, Usamaquin, and General Lilburn raised the sea-green flag over Boston. Cromwell's war was over. Democracy had emerged victorious. The following months would see further military reinforcements arrive as the British Republic cemented its control over New England. Alongside the military came the bureaucracy, who, under the guidance of Roger Williams, erected a new governmental structure for the region. No longer would the colonies be governed apart from one another. Going forward, the region would be ruled as the County of America, which, just like the other counties of Britain, would enjoy full suffrage for all men, including the Indians, who, through the intervention of Governor Williams, were able to secure ownership of their ancestral lands with a large degree of autonomy, whilst being under the military protection of the British Republic. 
Even as some hawkish congressmen pushed for further colonization, the Lilburn administration was adamant that the limits of America County would be the limits of the British presence in North America. After all, even if they had wished to expand, the British were effectively boxed in. To the north lay the French, who had quickly annexed Maine in the destructive aftermath of Cromwell's war. To the south and west lay the Nederlander colony of New Amsterdam. However, just beyond New Amsterdam, there was a very different civilization emerging in the American South. Just like in New England, British people had come across a vast ocean to erect a new civilization in the image of their idealized version of Britain, but one which was very different from that of the Levelers. In 1606, the colony of Virginia had been established, named in honor of the Virgin Queen Elizabeth I. The colony's capital was Jamestown, the first permanent British settlement in the Americas. Jamestown's early years were defined by disease, famine, and violence between the British settlers and the Powhatan Indians of the region. By the time of the British Civil Wars, Virginia was a crown colony known for its strong royalist and Anglican sentiments. The close relationship between Virginia and the crown, exemplified by Governor William Berkeley's unwavering loyalty to King Charles I, meant that when the British Civil Wars broke out, the vast majority of the Virginian population sided with the king, unlike in New England. Throughout the course of the British Civil Wars, the patriotic loyalists of Virginia were forced to watch from the sidelines as, to their horror, their homeland was consumed by chaos. In September of 1648, word had first reached the shores of Virginia that the situation in the British Isles was rapidly deteriorating, as a peasant uprising in the tradition of Watt Tyler's Rebellion had reshaped the power dynamics in Britain. Then, the merchant ships never arrived in October or November. Finally, in December 1648, Trading vessels from Britain arrived once more in Virginia, bearing shocking news. On August 26, 1648, London had fallen to the peasants, who now called themselves the Levellers. They had proclaimed a republic in Britain, in the style of Rome. However, the worst news came last. On October 5th, Edinburgh, the king's capital, had fallen to these Levellers and their army of bandits. The king and his family narrowly escaped their clutches, fleeing only at the last moment at the urging of their loyal subjects. The royal family was now stranded in France, where they had obtained asylum in Normandy, thanks to the merciful Cardinal Massaron, the first minister of France, and Queen Anne, the queen regent of France. When this news reached the ears of Governor Berkeley, he became resolute in his mission to come to the aid of the royal family and all remaining cavaliers stranded in Europe. The governor of Virginia immediately drafted a letter to the royal family, inviting King Charles to leave Normandy behind and seek refuge amongst his supporters in Virginia sending this letter to France on one of his ships. Concurrently, Berkeley also began planning a series of voyages to the British Isles to help smuggle stranded royalists to Virginia. On January 10th, 1649, Governor Berkeley's ship reached France. With a letter bearing his seal, the representatives of Virginia secured an audience with the exiled king, Charles I, on January 15th. The king, who had fallen into the deepest of depressions following his flight from Edinburgh months ago, grew angered by Berkeley's offer to relocate to Virginia. His few remaining spies on the British Isles had recently reaffirmed that the time was not yet right to attempt a restoration, amidst a flurry of revolutionary sentiment sweeping across Britain. But this? This relocation to a malarial marshland inhabited by peasants and savages? To relocate to Virginia would be to forsake his claim to the throne forever. The king stormed out of the room, leaving the Virginians feeling very defeated. However, in the night, Charles and his wife, Queen Henrietta Maria, would have a long and difficult discussion. The Queen had heard of the news from Paris. The judiciary of Paris had recently moved to directly challenge the power of the French crown, fighting against financial edicts meant to increase taxation, to help the Kingdom of France recover financially from the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War and Peace of Westphalia. The nobility, judiciary, and peasantry all stood defiant against the crown, and... As tensions worsened, by January 1649, Paris was under siege by an army of veterans led by rebellious nobles. Bandits roamed the countryside as France's economy and society were battered after years of war. Henrietta Maria feared for the future of the Stuarts in France, and implored her husband to accept the offer and take his rightful place on the throne of England, Scotland, and Ireland in the temporary capital of Jamestown, until he could be restored properly in London. The Queen's tears and her pleading moved the King greatly. He would not subject his family to living through another civil war so soon after the last. 
On January 16, 1649, King Charles summoned the representatives of Governor Berkeley to his residence and announced that he would accept the governor's offer. Queen Henrietta Maria, Prince Charles, heir to the throne, and the rest of the king's legitimate children would all accompany the king, as well as his remaining retinue of servants and advisors. Prince James, Charles's younger brother, would protest vehemently against the move. After much arguing, Prince James convinced his mother, who convinced his father, to allow him to remain in France under the tutelage of Henri de la Tour d'Auvergne, Viscount of Turenne. On February 1st, 1649, the royal family and their retinue set sail on three vessels provided by the embattled Cardinal Massaron, accompanied by the ships of the Virginian envoys. Their destination? Jamestown, Virginia. On April 4th, 1649, the king and his family arrived in Jamestown after a long voyage. A crowd of supporters and spectators arrived in the port of Jamestown to welcome their king to the New World. An eyewitness account from an anonymous member of the king's retinue would later state that the landing at Jamestown was the first time they had seen the monarch smile since the fall of Edinburgh. Work quickly began on erecting a new castle for the king, although this work proceeded slowly due to the limited manufacturing capabilities of Jamestown. For the time being, the provisional throne, King Edward's chair, was placed in Jamestown Church. With the arrival of the king, many more followed. Cavaliers fleeing Republican Britain and the Kingdom of Ireland slowly yet steadily arrived, seeking refuge in Virginia, united by a desire to live under the king God had chosen for them. King Charles, inspired by Cardinal Massaron and his service to Louis, the boy king of France, would create the office of First Minister of Virginia to serve as his personal representative in the political affairs of the nation he was rebuilding in America. For this position, King Charles would select one of the most steadfast loyalists left alive, Lawrence Washington. Washington was the protege of William Laud, the late Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been executed by Parliament for implementing Charles's religious reforms. Washington, who had served as the proctor of Oxford University and persecuted many Puritans, was also known as an arbiter of traditional English faith and loyalty to the crown. For this, he would be knighted for his service, made first minister of Virginia, and would be appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury in exile, the head of the Anglican Church. Archbishop Washington would swear a public oath of eternal loyalty to the king and his blood on May 1, 1649. Following his swearing of the oath, the Archbishop would deliver a brief speech in Jamestown Square. Fellow subjects of His Majesty, King Charles I, I come before you today as a man of God, humbled by the greatness and generosity of our King. We stand here now as the last readout of Old England. Within our souls we carry our culture. Within our hearts we carry the desire to live in the way the people of Britain have always lived, guided by the King that the Lord God put on earth to rule over us in all his wisdom. In our minds, we carry the willpower and determination to rebuild, to build a new England here in the new world. And in our hands, we carry the strength to sweep away the devilish savagery that has claimed dominion over this virgin land. As we work, we work with this eternal vow in our hearts. Virginia, the loyal dominion, will serve as the seed from which will grow the fruits of reclamation. England is not yet lost. Scotland is not yet lost. Ireland is not yet lost. We will reclaim our rightful lands in due time. So for now, work joyously, strive for greatness, for we work to build a better future in the name of bringing glory to our King and our Lord Jesus Christ. Long live the King, long live England. For the Kingdom of England, Scotland, and Ireland in exile, often simply called Virginia by outsiders, one of the most vital components of the state was its foreign policy. Under King Charles, throughout the 1650s, Virginia would pursue his policy of reconciliation and non-recognition. In 1650, a Virginian diplomatic expedition to Spain worked tirelessly to secure Spanish support for the fledgling kingdom in exile. Although it was costly, the crown was able to secure beneficial trade deals with both Spain and, more importantly, New Spain, thanks to the affability of the Spanish king, Felipe IV. Along with these trade deals, Spain also pledged in a joint declaration with the kingdom in exile to never recognize or trade with the, quote, bandit authorities in London, end quote. In exchange, for a fair price, the British crown would sell to Spain all of its Caribbean colonies. 1650 also saw William Stone, the governor of Maryland, swear allegiance to the crown, bringing Maryland and Virginia together in a personal union under King Charles I. As Virginia focused on developing and growing its strength, the years began to go by. By 1655, the political situation on the Atlantic coast had begun to shift. This year saw the Netherlands seize the Swedish colony of New Sweden, crushing Sweden's dreams of empire in the Americas and cementing the Netherlands as a great regional power. 
Across mainland Europe, Virginian representatives sought to mend ties fraught by years of religious war with other European nations in the face of a rising British Republic. Virginia's economy would be built around cheap American exports to mainland Europe in exchange for those nations refusing to trade or recognize the new leveler government in Britain. However, the affairs of mainland Europe would grow ever complex and volatile in the aftermath of the leveler revolution in Britain. A wave of revolutionary change, born on the shores of a free Britain, was gaining traction. Soon, it loomed over the shores of mainland Europe. But that is a story for another time. Stay tuned for part 5 of What If the Levelers Won the British Civil Wars, coming soon.